will hit record. Um, here we go. Nitzavim in a nutshell. The word Nitzavim means you stand firm. So the parsha of Nitzavim includes some of the most fundamental principles of the Jewish faith, the unity of Israel, right? That's the opening phrases of the parsha. You stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your heads, your tribes, your elders, your officers, and every Israelite man, your young ones, your wives, the stranger in your gate, from your wood hewer to the water drawer, drawer. In other words, everybody stands together in the covenant before Hashem. The Torah also discusses the future redemption. Moses warns of the exile and desolation of the land that will result in Israel's abandon if Israel abandons God's laws. But then he prophesizes that in the end, you will return to the Lord your God. If your outcast shall be at the ends of the heavens, from there will the Lord your God gather you and bring you into the land which your forefathers have possessed. In other words, no matter how far we're dispersed, God will bring us back. The practicality of the Torah, which um, Moshe says it's not distant, it's easy for us to achieve. Uh, we know that this, this is the verse that the Tanya is founded upon, as we discussed on Fridays, because Moshe seems to be saying that it's easy, it's accessible. But uh, the question is, is it indeed that accessible? But that's another story. So the practicality of the Torah, for the mitzvah which I command you this day, it is not beyond you nor is it remote from you. It is not in heaven. It is not across the sea. Rather, it is very close to you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may do it. And that's uh, another important theme. And finally, the end of the parsha, we have the reiteration of the idea of free choice and making the right choice. So freedom of choice. I have set before you life and goodness and death and evil in that I command you this day to love God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments. Life and death I have set before you, blessing and curse, and you shall choose, and you shall choose life. So this is a very short parsha, but uh, again, as we mentioned, some of the most important principles of the Torah are um, in this parsha. Okay, let's see where to begin. It's always good to begin the beginning of the verse, the beginning of the Torah. So we'll read some of the verses inside, and then we'll see where we get to. Seven Torah reading. Okay, so let's read the first verse. You all, you are all standing this day before the Lord your God. Your God, the tribes of your... Again, you are all standing this day before the Lord your God, the leaders of your tribes, your elders and your officers, every man of Israel, your young children, your women, and your convert who is, who is within your camp, both your woodcutters and your water drawers, that you may enter the covenant of the Lord your God and his oath, which the Lord your God is making with you this day. What is the oath? Well, the oath, we've been talking about the oath before. And also we have been talking about the, we have been talking about the oath in last Parsha. And we reiterated this, we, we, we reiterated in this Parsha. And again, he talks about in order to establish you this day as his people and that he will be your God as he spoke to you. And as he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, and then verse 13 and 14 are fascinating. But not only with you am I making this covenant and this oath, but with those standing here with us today before the Lord your God, and also with those who are not here with us this day. In other words, the oath is with everybody, both the people present and the people not present. How there can be an oath with people not present is another discussion. Maybe we'll get to that. Um, and then Moshe talks about the idea if there's somebody who thinks he can survive us and he'll be protected because, because um, God is... God is um, watering the entire region, so I'll also get watered. And only was I'm only individual, so we say, no, God will punish him. And then we talk about the, the final generation, we jump to the final generation. So let's look at verse 21. A little harsh, but we got to get a little harshness here. And at a late and the later generation, your descendants who will rise after you, along with the foreigner who comes from a distant land, 
will say upon seeing the plagues of that land and the diseases with which with the Lord struck it. In other words, in the end of times, in the, in the later generations, if you come and see the land or a, or a, um, or a nachri or a foreigner comes to see the land, this is, and, and they will see the, the, the diseases and the desolation. What will they see? Verse 22, sulfur and salt have burned up its entire land. It cannot be sown, nor can it grow anything. Not even any grass will sprout upon it. It is like the overturning of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Sevoyim, which the Lord overturned in his fury and in his rage. This is very harsh. We're comparing Israel to Sodom and Amorah, which were the wicked cities that were destroyed in the book of Genesis. And all the nations will say, why did the Lord do this to the land? What is the reason for this great rage of fury? Then they will say it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God, the God of their fathers, the covenant which he made with them when he took them out of the land of Egypt. Verse 25, for they went and served other deities, prostrating themselves to them, to the, to them deities which they had not known and which he had not apportioned to them. And the Lord's fury raged against the land, bringing upon it the entire curse within this book. And the Lord uprooted them from upon their land and fu with fury, anger, and great wrath. And he cast them to another land as it is this day. The hidden things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things apply to us and to our children forever, that we may fulfill all the words of this Torah. Okay, so it's very harsh. What do we want to talk about over here? So the first thing, it's very interesting. We're talking about the foreigners coming from a distant land and talked about the desolation of the land. So we have the very famous uh, Connecticut native, Mark Twain, who went to Israel in the 18, I think, 50s or 40s, and he described Israel as total, completely desolate. And that was part of the... Uh, we're part of the part of the covenant, part of what Moshe what, what Moshe tells the people, because what Moshe tells the people is that um, in the rebuke he says a verse that means that the land will be desolate when your enemies are there, and Rashi points out something very interesting that that it sounds like a curse. It's actually a comfort that no one else will find comfort in the land of Israel. Right? If you're exiled from your home and, and it remains desolate is one thing, but if you're exiled from your home and somebody else is living there and flourishing there, then the pain is so much greater. So what Rashi says is what, 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 when this verse, the verse in last week's partial, but also reiterated here, when it describes the desolation of the land, that's actually a comfort for the Jewish people. Okay. Now, let's think about this for a second. Somebody pointed out something very interesting, that when you talk about um, the connection between land and people, or land and cultures, or land and nations. So in, I think in all, or almost all cultures that we know of, the relationship, if you need a metaphor for the relationship, is the relationship of uh, parents and children, right? So we're the children, we have the motherland, we have the fatherland, right? You have um, a patriarch, which means the love, the person, someone who loves, no, um, a patriot, Patriot is someone who loves the fatherland, and that's the relationship. But when it comes to the Jewish people, the land is not, is not the metaphor is not um, parents. The metaphor is a spouse. Uh, we talk about the prophets. We talk about the prophets is, is, is um, in, the, in the book of prophets when it talks about the Messianic era, when the Jews come back, it's always a metaphor of bride and groom reuniting. And, that's, and there's a very profound difference. The difference is that when you talk about parents and children, you can't really divorce your parents or your children. In other words, it's an eight bond. It's not dependent on what you do. So we say, we were born here. This is our connection to this land. No matter what we do, there's, there's no moral demand. for. There's no covenant between the people on the land. And that's why we were born here. We expect to be here. We have the right to be here. When it comes to the Jewish people and uh, the land of Israel, God keeps talking about the covenant. And the covenant is the metaphor of marriage. And in marriage, you can't just say, well, we're married, so therefore I can do whatever I want. The whole idea of the marriage is that this is a relationship that's predicated upon a commitment. And if there's no commitment, there's no relationship. And like I said, if you look at the book of the prophets, there's many, many times where the relationship between the, God, between the land and the Jewish people is the relationship not of parents and children, which is most cultures, but with, with, with spouses, which means that we're here. We don't, we, don't, we, we don't have a birthright to be here. Okay, I know that now they have birthrights, so they're spending a lot of money telling the young Jews that they have a birthright for Israel. Of course, it was given to us. The point is, the right to live in the land is predicated not on just being, but on what we do. And that's clear in this week's Parsha. So that is one point to talk about. 
Another to point to talk about is that you, if you want to think about the, I think we talked about it. We talked about it in the past, but it's still nice to think about. If you look at verse twenty-seven, which describes how the Jewish people served idols, and therefore the Lord's wrath raged against the land, bringing upon it the entire wrath, uh, bringing upon it the, the entire curse written in this book, and the Lord uprooted them from their from their land with fury anger and, and great wrath and he cast them to another land as is this as it is this day he cast them he cast them by is to throw away so it's almost like god threw them away to this land now it's a shame that we don't have the hebrew torah because or even the chumash because in the chumash the word and he threw them out he cast them out the letter lamid is a large letter so we know that in the in the uh, in the Torah scroll, most letters are whatever average size, obviously. In other words, most are the same size. And there are a few places where, where, where there's a small letter and a few places where you have a large letter. And those that's critical for the for the, for the Torah scroll to be kosher. You have to preserve those that those those font sizes. So here we have a large lamid. What does the large lamid represent? Vayashli chain. Large Lamed. So I said this in the past, but it's nice to say anyway. Um, and, that, and that is as follows. So one point is like this. This is from the Kliyakar. Kliyakar says that the Torah here is alluding to the idea that, yes, there's an exile, but there's also going to be rebirth. And where you see that, that that's optimism, despite the fact of the great darkness, that there's going to be a rebirth. You see that in the Jewish calendar and the way the Jewish people mark time. As we mentioned, I think we mentioned yesterday, that the Jewish people are, the Medrash says that the Jewish people are likened to the moon. They're compared to the moon. And that's why the way they count time is based on the moon. We have a lunar calendar. Well, not exclusively lunar, but primarily lunar. Um, because we like the idea of the moon. The sun represents the idea that this, this, you know, the light of the sun is consistent. It's powerful. Um, the moon's light is not consistent. And it gets weaker, it waxes, it wanes. So it seems like it's the weaker luminary. Why would we want to be like the moon as a culture and not like the sun? So one point is for the Jewish people, we like the idea of rebirth, that first of all, we recreate ourselves. And even in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a situation where we, we don't see any of our light, we know that that's just temporary and the light will, we, we, we will, the light will reappear. And that's, that has been the Jewish story. Um, so. One way to think about this is that that large lamid represents the number 30 because every letter represents a number. And then you get to yud is 10, chaf is 20, lamid is 30. Once you get to the first 10, it goes into the tens. So lamid represents 30. So you have, he cast them out and then there's a large lamid which, which represents 30. But what does that tell you? What does 30 have to do with the exile? So the Kliyakar does the math and he says that, I think it's based on a Kabbalistic <laughs> concept because he probably he may have seen it in the Zohar, I don't know. But Kliyakar says like this, he says, when were the Jewish people uh, exiled from the land? 30 generations after it was promised to Abraham. Do the math. It's 30 generations from Abraham to the for exile, to the, to the destruction of the first temple. And the first sort of the first the first 15 generations is the moon is waxing it's growing our connection to the land is strengthening more or less i mean there's some bumps in the road but more or less we're we're working toward establishing ourselves in the land and the epitome the height of the jewish people's possession of the land both physically and spiritually is of course the 15th generation because the 15th generation is when you have a full moon this is what the Zohar talks about. The Zohar talks about the moon is full on the 15th day. And that's the time of Solomon. If you want to talk about that, you have to place yourself, where was, when were the Jewish people established and set with a, with a, with a, with a um, spiritual capital and a strong, a strong, a strong uh, uh, um, kingdom and lived in peace? If you have to put yourself as not a, not saying an individual, but I'm, not, but I'm just saying, if you want to talk about as, as, the nation. When was the nation the most settled and sere and 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 uh, um, serene and spiritual time? That would be the Solomon. David got rid of 
fought all the wars. So Solomon was already a time of peace. Solomon in the time, Solomon's times, they built a temple and everything was fine. The description is each person sat under their gaffna and there is vine and under his fig tree. Everything is peaceful. The next generation, right after Solomon, day 16, what happens day 16th of the month? The moon is still full, but it starts waning. It starts getting smaller. And indeed, the generation right after Solomon, the kingdom splits. There's a split in the kingdom between Israel and Judea. And that's really the beginning of the downfall, the beginning of the end. And then it deteriorates ultimately, more or less. And then you get to the 30th generation when the Jewish people are cast away. So the Kleokar says this large lamed in the Torah, going back to Moses, is an allusion to the fact that we wax and wane like the moon. The moon has 30 days, more or less 30 days, 29 and a half, 30 days. And that's the idea that even, I'm not saying that it had to be that we're going to go to exile in 30 days, but it did work out that way, that there's 30 generations. But the message here is that there's going to be rebirth, just like the moon is reborn. So that's one thing with the, with the large Lamed. Another point of the last Lamed, large Lamed, and that comes from Rabbi Shamshan Falhir, she says, very interesting. He says, the word, a very, it's a very harsh word, by Yash Lichen, God threw them away, cast them away to a different land. Um, it sounds like we're, he's done with us, which he isn't, because we'll read the next page and we'll see he's not done with us. But the Kliyakar says like this, he says, when you put a, I'm sorry, the, the, the Shamshan Fal Hirsch, he says, when you put a large Lamed, what that does is it overshadows the Shin. Right? I'm pointing here, Bayash Lichem, the word Shin, Bayash Lichem, the Shin um, um, would make, would makes it mean cast away. But imagine there was no Shin and it was just, just a Lamed, then what, it would, what would it say? It would say, Vayo Lichem, he led them to a dis different land like this day. Now, casting them to another land and leading them to another land is a very big difference. Because when you say God cast us away, he says, why are we here? We're only here because he threw us out of Israel. But there's no reason to be here. There's no mission to be here. There's no spiritual purpose to be here. We're just here because we were thrown out. So wherever we end up, we end up, right? Like the, like the, you throw out a, gla a glass a jug out your window, and it will be it will be it will shatter everywhere. So why did one piece go here and one piece go there? That's what happens. That's what happens when you cast things away. But if you that's our that could be our perspective. We feel like we were cast away. But with the large lama, the Torah is telling you one second. If you look a little deeper, you will see that it's not a question of casting us away. It's a question of leading us, which means the reason why we're here. We're here for a mission, for a purpose, to influence uh, the to, to spread the message to the rest of the world. Etc. But the bottom line is that this divine providence, why we're here, it's not just that we've been cast away. And the large Lamed highlights that from God's perspective, it's much, it's, it's he led us, not he cast us away. But we do leave the shin because from the perspective of our perspective, but more importantly, the perspective from of the Gentile, the foreigner who's coming to see the land of Israel, that's the way the Gentiles may look at it. And we've been cast away. While in reality, we have not been cast away. We have been led away. But that's a very important, a very important, a very important uh, distinction, and that's alluded to by the large Lamed. So that is just a little bit about the exile and about the fact that uh, there's a covenant with the land because we're not we're not the children of the land. The land is not our motherland or our fatherland. The land is our spouse, and the spouse relationship is a covenant, and therefore you need the loyalty. So that's the that's, uh, first point you want to make. Okay, questions, comments, otherwise we continue. We continue, now we get to probably the most upbeat and positive verses in all of the Torah. After the last two weeks have been very harsh, last week and the first half of this week's Parsha, now we get to the positive.
Okay, what happens after this? Verse um, four, Bahaya. And it will be, so we're in the fourth reading, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse one. And it will be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, that you will consider to your heart, you will take this to heart among all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. In other words, after all this happens, you'll, you'll get the message. You, you realize what happened. You realize that we were in the land. You realize that we served the idols and we were, we were banished because we abandoned God's covenant. What will happen then? And you will return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you will listen to his voice according to all that I am commanding you this day, you and your children. So in other words, verse 2 describes return to God. You will return to the Lord your God. What happens then? Verse 3. Then the Lord your God will bring, you, will bring back your exiles, and he will have mercy upon you. He will once again gather you from all the nations where the Lord your God has dispersed you. Even if your exiles are at the end of the heavens, the Lord your God will gather you from there, and he will take you from there. And the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your forefathers possessed, and you too will take possession of it. And he, and he will do good to you, and he will make you more numerous than your forefathers. So what have we read? Verse 2, we read about return. While we're still in exile, we're going to take this message to heart, and we will return to Hashem. Verse 3, 4, 5, describe how God will bring us back to Israel, which we'll talk about that later, because there's two opinions of what exactly they're saying, but that's another case. And then verse 6 goes back to the spiritual service of God. And verse 6 is a very interesting verse. Uh, let's see, verse 7 is also. Give me just one second. Um, yeah, verse 7 also. Yeah, verse, verse, verse 8 is also. So let's see what happens. After we came back to Israel. So everything is fine. We repented. We returned to God. God brought us back to Israel. It's wonderful. No, verse 6 is another step. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offsprings so that you may love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul for the sake of your life. In other words... Apparently, the, re the, the repentance, the return that we did within exile is not enough. That was verse 2. But then we were after verse 2, we come back to Israel. After Israel, God circumcises the heart. Whatever that means, it means he moves away the covering, and now it's much easier for us to love God. And then we continue and, verse, and read verse uh, the fifth section. The Lord, your God, will place all these curses upon your enemies and upon your adversaries who pursued you. And you will return and listen to the voice of the Lord, your, your, the Lord and fulfill his commandments, which I command you this day. In other words, after you return to the land of Israel, again, atatashuv, you will return. So it seems like there's another level of teshuva once they come to the land of Israel. So what's the pattern again? The pattern is that you have, we're going to be in, in Israel. There's going to be repentance. I'm sorry, yet yeah, return, return to God. I'm sorry, we're going to be, we're going to be in exile. There's going to be return to God. That return to God motivates Hashem. Once we return to God, Hashem brings us back to the land of Israel. After we come back to the land of Israel, Hashem then circumcises our heart, which leads us to a deeper level of return to Hashem. Okay, so far so good. So we have re re return, return to God. God brings us back to Israel, and then God helps us even more to return to God and to circumcise our heart which we'll talk about what that means. Okay, fine. So what is the first thing we want to talk about? We want to talk about the idea of teshuva. So we're the before of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which we talk about teshuva. So we'll take a minute or two to, to, to discuss the idea of teshuva. We may have alluded to, alluded to it in the last couple of weeks. What is interesting about the commandment to return is that according to most opinions, not everybody, but according to most opinions, there is no commandment to return. There is no commandment that if you uh, uh, violate God's will to return to God. There's no such commandment. What do you have in the Torah? So you have two things. First of all, you have the commandment, which Maimonides counts, for example, a technical commandment, which is um, to confess. And the commandment is, if you want to return to God, this is the way it's done. But that doesn't mean it's a commandment to return, right? So, for example, you say, uh, there's a mitzvah that if you want to divorce, this is how you divorce. 
doesn't mean there's a mitzvah to divorce, even though, yes, it's one of the 248 positive commandments is to divorce with the document, to do it in the Jewish way. But again, just because there's a description, the mitzvah is how to do something, it doesn't mean there's a mitzvah to do it. So according to most opinions, almost everybody, there is no mitzvah, there's no commandment to return to Hashem. Even in this week's parsha which is everybody refers to as the portion of repentance, portion of return, because finally here we read how finally the Jewish people, after all the calamities will happen, the Jewish people will return to God. So if you look at this week's parsha, there's no commandment to return. What do we have? We have a story. We have God describing what's going to happen. But a story is not a commandment. So if God tells us everything to do, tells us to love God, tells us to love our fellow Jew, etc., does everything, why can't he tell us to return? And why is there no mitzvah to return? So what we're trying to get at here is that the concept of returning to God is actually much, much deeper than a commandment. And that's why the commandment doesn't capture the idea. And that's why there is no mitzvah. There is no commandment to return. So let's start with the technical. Technical, Technically, there cannot be a commandment to return because, because the whole idea of, of the sin is that I don't care about what God tells me. So I violated the commandment. So what is it going to be a commandment to return? I'm not listening to the commandments. It's not going to help to command me to return. So that, but that's more a technical interpretation. The deeper interpretation is that when a person does a mitzvah, the, the, the 613 commandments, what, is, what do the commandments represent? The commandments represent I have to be told what to do. What is teshuva? In other words, that the will of God is external to me. God comes and tells me what to do. What is teshuva? What is return? Return is a much deeper place. Return is that I am motivated to return to God, not because God tells me I have to return, because I want to. In other words, it doesn't come from above. It doesn't, it's not an external force that's compelling me to do the right thing. But teshuva represents that the desire to do the right thing comes from one's deeper self. And that's why there is no commandment because there is no need for a commandment. So mitzvot represent, well, I may want to do something else. I want to do something else. I want to steal. I want to rob. I want to commit adultery. So God comes to 10 commandments and says, don't do it. Okay. So I'll listen to God. Okay, fine. So that's more external. That's the part of me that needs to be commanded. But then when you talk about teshuva, and this is the deep idea of teshuva, teshuva is there is no commandment of teshuva. There cannot be a commandment of teshuva because the whole point of teshuva is the whole point of return is that I return to God not because God is telling me to return, but because that is in line with my inner self. And therefore, doing the right thing now uh, um, resonates with me. Now, I did the wrong thing because there were layers, because I had external will. Teshuva is could you remove the layers of will and get to what you really want? And what do I really want? is that my, my inner will wants me to return to God. And therefore, first of all, there could be no commandment to, to, to return. And also, but, but, the, but, the, but, the, account, but the, the other side of that coin is, or the byproduct of that is, that we know what's going to happen. In other words, eventually, after I try everything else, eventually I'll discover that nothing else is making me happy, not necessarily as an individual, but as a collective, the Jewish people. Eventually, we're going to return back to God because that is our inner will. That's how we have the certainty that ultimately we'll return to God. So why is the story of Teshuvah represented? Why is, this, is the concept of Teshuvah represented in story form as opposed to commandment form, which is what the Torah tell, is all about, telling us what to do, is because Teshuvah, which we're going to engage in, which we already began to engage in, but the season of Teshuvah is the season of the high holidays, what does Teshuva represent? Teshuva represents that we're returning to God, not because God tells us to, because he's not telling us to do it. We want to do it. Why do we want to do it? Because that's our deeper will. We don't have to be told. But the other side of that, we know with certainty that it's going to happen. Eventually, we're going to return. And that's the story. The story is a prediction, but it's not a prediction because God knows the future. Yes, he knows the future, but it's more than that. He knows us. And because he knows our nature, he knows that ultimately we're going to return because that's a deeper nature. So it can take a thousand years, two thousand years. It doesn't matter. Eventually, that deeper will, it will emerge. And that's why in the story of Teshuvah, like I mentioned, in the story of Teshuvah, you have story, not commandment, because commandment does not express the depth of the idea of what Teshuvah is, of what the return is.
Okay, go ahead, Vicky. Oh, th thank you, Rabbi. I don't know if that's a good time, um, but um, I had a question at, uh, from, uh, about the very the very beginning of yes. the part. Uh, the demographics, the order that is it significant? Uh, so it's um, the men and then um, young children and then your women. Is it significant or is it because it's better understood that way? Um, I don't know. You could, could be that could be that you're saying it could be that we're saying that we're putting in all the groups and we're not uh, we're not making distinctions. We're, we're mixing them all together. That's possible, but it's not likely. To me, it seems that um, the women are later because in, at least in that culture, at least in those days, um, when it comes to the decisions and the and decisions of the culture, the men were the ones who decided. In other words, the men were decided whether or not we're serving idols. So that's why they're more prominent. You know the famous joke. The famous joke is that the man and woman, it was not a joke, it's a true story. Man and woman want to get married, but they're, 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 they 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 say, okay, so what are we going to do when we have disputes in the family? What who's going to who's going to determine? So the woman was very smart. The woman says, look, he says, you, my dear husband, a future husband, you're going to make all the big decisions. She says, I, I'll make all the small decisions. Okay, well, when the man who man wants to hear that, what else could he what else could he want? For sure, I'm marrying you 100. percent So they get married. Um, okay, where are we going to live? He says, where he wants to, she says, no, 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 that's a small decision. I'll tell you where we live. They have children. Where are we going to send the kids to school? No, no, that's a small decision. I'm in charge of that. And all of a sudden, the man realized that all the small decisions are, are all the decisions he wants to make are the small decisions. So she says, so he says, what are the big decisions? He says, ah, the big decisions is who do we agree with about who should win the Cold War? The United States or the Soviet Union? World politics. These are the big decisions. The small decisions about our house and how we live and how we don't live, these are the small decisions that are not so important that I get to make. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is, is that in that culture making the covenant, it was the men. The men were the ones who decided where, which direction we're going. Um, that's, that's probably the shot. Is there a hidden, hidden deeper meaning? Probably. What about small children before women? Well, even the small children, but, um, the, the, the children are, are, are the, the people who were more engaged in the worship were, were, were I guess, the males, I guess. Again, small, uh, small children, it says. It says small. Uh, um, what's the words? Tabchem. <laughs> young children. Yeah. I don't know if the emphasis is small. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the mystics say that there are 10 groups here. There are, ten, there are 10 categories. I didn't count it, but I, I guess I couldn't have faith in them. I guess I guess I could trust. I probably shouldn't, but uh, that's what the mystics say. And I think that the 10, of course, corresponds, according to the mystics, to the 10 um, spherot. In other words, within every person, you have all 10. Let's see if there's 10 here. So the head oh. of your tribes, it, it, it's like a, it, it's like a chachmar and stuff like that, and then you go yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Rasheicham, your head. Rasheicham is the first one. Yeah, I don't know how it aligns. I don't know if it aligns perfectly in that order. I don't know. Short That's answer. But, yeah, but but it still answers my question because if it's attribute, they're all important. So the order, it's just the. It it may be that it's important for the context. In other words, if you talk about the right to vote, right? The thing about the right to vote. So 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 what is the in other words, the right to decide which direction society is going into and the sort of, are we going to serve idols or are we going to adapt the, 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 the local idols, right? Who decides who decides what, what, what deity we worship? It's not a house decision. It's a culture decision, right? If you look at the, you mentioned the, 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 the kingdom split. So what happened when the kingdom split and sat in the days of Solomon's um, um, child, Rahab? Um, so the king who seceded said, look, we don't want all the Jewish people going to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage because then they're going to be influenced by the king of Judea. So we're going to make our own temple. And he made two big idols, one in Dan, all the way in the north, the other one in Beersheba, all the way in the south. And boom, everybody became idol worshipers. 
So in other words, it wasn't an individual person make, saying this is what we're going to do. It's as a culture, this is what we decided to do. So if that's the way you think about it, I think if you want to talk about who gets the right to vote, maybe that order lines up. The leaders, the men, children, women, women are later, but women are before the convert. Uh, and then, right, the foreigner, and then you have the people who are the wood choppers, so, so they're after that. Yeah, I think that's what's happening if you want to talk about the shock, a simple meaning. Thank you. I think Kabbalistic speaks better, Jimmy. Okay. okay, that's why we have it all. <laughs> okay, so let's think about this for a moment. We talked about the idea of the teshuva being a teshuva being a, a story, not a commandment, because commandment implies that the will of God is superimposed upon you from outside of you, and teshuva means it emerges from your from your inners. It comes from you. You are motivated to return, not because God commanded to, because if you look through the Torah, there is no commandment. So com I command. I'm not listening to you. So you say I command you to apologize. It doesn't work. I don't. I don't care about your commandments. So why do I apologize? Because I'm not happy, because I feel that this is wrong. So that comes from the deeper place within yourself. Fine. So that's the first step. Now, we want to talk about the return. And there's, there's, there's confusion. There's, I don't want to say there's confusion. Already when we get to last week's Parsha, there is, I'm sorry, what did I say? Yeah, last week's Parsha, we talk about the covenant. and the, the, so, so we had the rebuke in last week's Parsha. And then in the rebuke, you had the... Terrible rebuke, but it doesn't end on a positive note. It just ends, that's it. God will bring you back to Egypt. You'll be sold to Egypt. Nobody will purchase. Done. These are the words of the covenant. Done. If you look at the book of Deuteronomy, where there's also rebuke, there the rebuke is followed immediately with verses of God will remember us and not forget the covenant. So it ends on a positive note. Last week, no, there's no positive note. And then the positive note has to wait for this week. In other words, it's not a week apart, but it's a few verses apart, but it's a new section. And we have the positive that God will bring us back. So throughout the history, as we alluded to in the past, maybe even last week, I don't remember, throughout the history, different people want to, re some people view all of the exile, both rebukes as, as describing all the exile. And they say, okay, so the end is positive. Others want to separate it. They say the book of Deuteronomy, the book of, of Leviticus is talking about the first exile to Babylonia. The second book is talking about the exile that we have now, the exile of Rome. And we had talked about a little bit of this, of this, of this uh, dispute recently. Oh, I know when, on Sunday, because we talked about Yitzchak being the forerunner, that patriarchs being the forerunners of future Jewish history. And some people say that Isaac going down to Gerar is represents the Babylonian exile. And later Jacob going down to, to, to Egypt represents, well, I guess Abraham represents the, the first, the first one is Abraham. Abraham going to Abraham going to Egypt represents the Jewish people going to Egypt, and Isaac going down to Gerar represents the Jewish people going to Babylonia. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because there's a little bit of a of a of a of a bump in the road. Um when we talk about the return, there's too many verses. So some people, I'm going to give you one, one perspective, the perspective of the al Sheikh, And basically, it sounds like the, the repentance and it sounds like the repentance is happening in two stages. So why is the repentance happening in two stages? Right? Because we said, remember, we mentioned it says in verse two, it says return. Then three, four, five is God will bring you back to Israel. And six, oh, and then God will circumcise your heart. And then you're going to serve God fully. So it sounds like the repentance is two stages. It sounds like the return may be also be two stages. So different people are reading this differently. I'm going to give you the interpretation of the al Sheikh, who was 16th century Kabbalist in the holy city of Tzafat. And he was, he was a great Kabbalist. And there in Tzafat in this amazing time when many great sages were in Tzafat. And he says as follows. The way he reads it is, again, he's reading it from the historic lens. And he says that we're referring to two separate returns. One is after the destruction of the first temple, when the king, uh, the Persian king, King Cyrus, gave the Jewish people permission to return and to rebuild the temple. But at that point, only some Jews returned. And later, we're, we're also, later, we are alluding to 
the exile from the future redemption, which I guess began, but is not, 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 not fully, fully completed. But that's the future redemption, and that's also alluded to in the verse. So this is how the al reads it, verse 2. So again, verse 1 is, oh, when all these things happen, you'll be in the exile, and the blessings and the curses will occur, and you will return to Hashem. And you will consider to, in, in your heart. Tashevotah, you will take this message to heart in all the among all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. Verse 2, and you will return to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And you will listen to his voice according to all that I'm commanding you to this day and your children. So we return to heart, we listen to God's voice. Now we know it's not fully. How do we know? Because later it says again that God will circumcise our hearts. So we know it's not fully, but that's stage one. Okay, first step. What happens then? Then the Lord your God will bring back your exiles. And he will have mercy upon you. And he will once again gather you from all the nations where, where the Lord your God has dispersed you. What's the once again? So says the al Sheikh as follows. He says the first half of verse 3 is the first redemption after the Babylonian exile. The Lord your God will bring back your exiles and he will have mercy upon you. So what the al Sheikh says is why do we need mercy? We need mercy, says the Ashraf, because the teshuva, the return, was not complete. The fact that it wasn't complete is also expressed in the fact that not everybody returned, only a very small percentage of the Jewish people left Babylonia and came back to Israel. Um, so the first, first, for the first exile, it says, the first redemption, it says, it says, God will have compassion, will have mercy upon you because, yeah, you returned, but it's not, you were not fully deserving. That is the first half of verse three. And then he says, the second half of verse 3, he will once again, he will return. In other words, do it again. He will once again gather you from all the nations where the Lord your God has dispersed you, says the al that's the second exile. That's after the Roman, after the destruction of the second temple, the exile that we're in or where the end of. And that explains beautifully why number four, the verse number 4, even if your exiles will be at the end of the heavens, the Lord your God will gather you from there and he will take you from there. When the, after the first exile, our exiles were not at the ends of the heaven. We were just in Babylonia, not too far. The Jews were not dispersed throughout the world. So verse 4, which discusses that our exiles will be at the ends of the heaven, from there God will bring us back, is clearly the, 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 is clearly the, is clearly the, the describing the future redemption after the second exile, when the Jewish people are literally scattered throughout the entire earth, which we don't have after the first exile, which is the first half of verse three. So that's for that. Um, just to think about those two, the, 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 just to think about those two stages. And then after that happens, he talks about verse five, and the Lord your God will bring you to the land that your forefathers, your forefathers possessed, and you too will take possession of it. Yerishta. Yerishta, possession, possession expresses permanence. And they say that after, so that after the second exile, there are no longer any exiles. How could we be certain there'll be no more exiles? So that turns into verse number five. What does verse five say? And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offsprings so that you may love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. What does it mean that God will circumcise our heart? How do we know there'll be no other exiles? All this is tied into one and the same thing. What does it mean that God will circumcise our heart? So the first thing God said, the first thing, so I'm going to quote from Nachmanides. The first thing Nachmanides says is, what do you see in this pattern? This pattern you see that a person will try to make themselves more holy and more spiritual and more purified. So the sages say, if somebody tries to improve themselves, then God will help them. In other words, you're not expected to do everything. You're expected to start. And if you try, God will help. It says Nachmanides, that's verse two and three, verse two, verse two, verse, verse two and verse seven, verse six. Verse two is you return to God as much as you can. Could I circumcise my heart? We'll see what that means in a minute. No, I can't circumcise my heart. But don't worry. You return to Hashem. You do your part. After you do your part, Hashem will do his part. Like you say, you just say, if someone comes to become pure, Hashem will help him. So that's step number one. That's the first thing Nachmanides says. The next thing Nachmanides says is what does it mean God will circumcise our heart? So he says something fascinating. He says that ever since the story in the book of Genesis. Remember, we're at the end of the Torah, we're at the beginning of the Torah, the end of the Torah. The beginning of the Torah is the story of the tree of knowledge. 
What's the tree of knowledge? Free choice. That the um, um, there's temptation. Adam and Eve, when they're garden, of, when they're in the garden of Eden, there's no temptation. And then they consume the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Now they have negativity within their heart. And now, for the next that for the next few thousand years, the battle between good and evil rages within them. Says Nachmanides at the end of days, once God brings us back to Israel, God will circumcise our heart. Circumcise our heart means we have no longer any desire for negativity. That's the meaning of circumcising the heart. Now, so we'll be like Adam before the sin. And therefore, I guess a, I guess a byproduct of that is, that is, that is, um, that is, therefore, we know there'll be no other exile, there'll be no other sin after because our heart is circumcised. When your heart is circumcised, you do what's natural for you. And just like for a natural, it's natural for a, a person or for any creation to want to self-preserve, you know, an animal's not going to jump into the fire. A, a, a human being is not going to want to go against the will of God. But now all this ever since the book of Genesis. But now at the end of Deuteronomy, we say, what's going to happen at the end of the time? So after we after do what we could, then God, God circumcising the hearts means sin anymore. So that's Nachmanides' um, fascinating interpretation because we... So that's Nachmanides' fa is fa fascinating interpretation because we always talk about that when we study in Genesis, the story of the tree of knowledge, many of the commentaries say the purpose is to return to the serenity of the Garden of Eden. So where do we, where do we return to that? What does the Torah allude to that? Well, the Torah alludes to that in, in, number, in, 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 the, in Deuteronomy at the end, when God circumcises our hearts. We go back to Adam, Adam and Eve before the sin. Of course, we're here. It's a whole different meaning. Now it's much more meaningful because we had free choice and we had thousands of years of human history to play out the free choice. But ultimately, the goal is not free choice. The ultimately, the goal is to sense naturally that um, connecting to God is good in life and we're not going to run away from, from, from life. That's the end of this parsha. The end of this parsha talks about choosing life and choosing good. The thing is that now um, God says that good is life and evil is death. God says it, but we don't always sense it. Sometimes it seems to us that it's the opposite. But when the end of days, the messianic era, when God circumcises our heart, we see that connection naturally between um, we see that connection naturally between uh, ourselves and uh, between 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 uh, the, the the good choice and how good choice is life, and therefore we're not going to do something that's against that's against our own life. So that's the story in short. There's more to say. Let's see if we can want to add something. But in the meantime, if anyone has any comments, please share. Rev, I have one quick question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. A quick question is, so does that mean that in the end of days, we no longer have free choice since yeah. our will is totally aligned with Hashem? Correct. There's no free choice. So what's the point of existence? That, that, that's the question. And indeed, some of the prophets say there will be days when a person is going to say, Ain't days where there's no desire. In some sense, in some sense, the struggle is over. And therefore, in some sense, we're missing, we're, miss, we're missing some of the excitement of life. But what we get, we get the benefit of appreciating, the, the, appreciating what we have achieved. In other words, we, 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 we uh, get the benefit of the fruit of our labor of, 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 of all of human history. So in other words, in some sense, it's not, a time, it's not a time for battle, it's a time for pleasure, it's time to enjoy. So if you wanna talk about it, it's time for retirement. What does retirement mean? Retirement means you 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 get the pleasure from what we have achieved. Pleasure is the the pleasure in the spiritual sense is the ultimate pleasure is connection to God, and then life is about connecting to God. It's not about the struggle because we overcame the struggle. We did whatever we could on our own, but ultimately the circumcision of the heart, the fact that we move the concept of struggle, that we cannot do. That only Hashem could do. So that's part of the umal Hashem alokecha. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. We cannot do that. Person, the best a person can do is we're going to see is, 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 is to make the right choice within the free choice. And we keep going, we're going to go back to free choice at the end of this parsha if we have time. And then we're not going to have time. But we also have the verse, it's close to you, this matter in your heart, in your in your mouth, in your heart to do. And like we talked about the Tanya the last 36 weeks, that you can't control your heart, but you can control your action. And that's what we can, we are, we, we, that's what we can do on our own. We could do control our choices. But ultimately, what Hashem does, it's beyond our own power. But what Hashem does, Hashem circumcises the heart. And ultimately, the struggle doesn't last forever. Ultimately, we get to a time where the, where the, where the concealment, the, the, the concealment is, is, is removed. 
And the fact that everything that, that, that obscures God's presence is removed. And therefore, the natural choice is to choose what's good. And that will be, that will be ultimately, that reality will be restored. That's, what, that's the way Nachmanides reads these verses. That Umal Hashem Lekecha, God will circumcise your heart, is we're back to pre-sin, which means naturally we, we choose good and there's no, there's, there is no temptation for negativity. Thank you. Now, now, now the, the previous Rebbe writes that when Mashiach comes, we're going to miss the days of the exile. We're going to miss the struggle. Today we struggle, always say, oh, he wants serenity. And then you're right, serenity is nice in some ways, but don't make no mistake, uh, we're going to miss, we're going to miss the times of the struggle. So it's like in life, unfortunately, the human condition is that whatever we have, we're waiting for the next thing. And then when the next thing comes, we overcome this and we miss it. So it's good to have the awareness that no matter how difficult the struggle is, you say it's very difficult, but you know, ultimately one day we're going to, we're going to miss this time. You know, that's what people tell me when I have young children say, oh, one day you'll miss that time raising the children. I'm like, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe no, but that's what they say. So <laughs> you have to, it's good to know in advance that you may get to miss this one day. So that's what it seems like that uh, when Mashiach comes, we're going to miss the struggle of the time. We're going we're gonna to yearn for the struggle of the time of exile. But ultimately, ultimately, once, once the truth is out, the truth is out. And the truth, the truth is, like the Torah continues, that the good, life is good. Good is life. In other words, the ultimate value is to connect to God. And when, we've, we, when that truth emerges, you, you can't make a bad choice because you realize that connection to God is synonymous with life. And, um, and evil is synonymous with death. You're disconnecting from your source. So once that truth is felt, there could be no possibility for naturally for a person desiring negativity. Okay, I think we'll stop here only because it's 11.03, not because there's not much to say, uh, a lot more to say. I think we'll stop here for next year. If you want more, make sure to come back next year. Uh, same time, same place, in good health. Thank you, and uh, not to should be a good year. Only good things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.